Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about William Shakespeare's play, Henry VI, Part 2. Um, this was not the original title of the play. Um, Henry VI, Part 2 was the title that was given to this play when it was collected up for the first folio, published in 1623. Um, originally, because when they collected up the first folio and they were doing the history plays, they put them in chronological order. Um, originally, this was probably written before Henry VI, Part One, which I've done a video on before. Um, but I... Um, it, it seems somewhat contentious what the timeline is, but it seems likely that this was written, part two was written around 1590, 1591, um, whereas the first portion was written maybe 1594, though that dating is not secure. But the original title of Henry VI, part two, was something uh, along, so this is what was, was um, printed with a quarto version that came out in uh, 1594. The original title, according to the quarto, was the first part of the contention of the two famous houses of York and Lancaster with the death of the good Duke Humphrey. Which is somewhat uh, less pithy than Henry VI, part two. Um, so this is a play. So this, the events of this do follow Henry the Sixth, Part One, essentially leading into the War of the Roses, the war between the houses of Lancaster, sing, uh, symbolized by the Red Rose, and the House of York, symbolized by the White Rose. You can't see this very well, but this is a, a pin for the White Rose of York. Basically, this is a play about the beginning of this civil war. The conflict between the houses of York and Lancaster over who was the legitimate ruler, uh, which, which uh, genealogical line were the legitimate rulers of England. One of the th So, we've got Richard Plantagenet, Duke of York, father of Richard III, uh, and that's important. I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, he believes, and he convinces several other uh, lords, that his claim to be to be the rightful king of England is stronger than Henry the Sixth's. Um, Henry the Sixth is not a particularly strong ruler, and so. Uh, it's actually not that difficult necessarily to persuade some people to oppose him uh, because Richard Plantagenet would be a much stronger king. So we've got those issues swirling around. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about ambition and the legitimacy of pursuing ambition and things like this. Um, and so there's a couple of couple of major elements that I want to sort of talk through. Um, the first one I want to talk, I want, I want to actually look at um, this speech from York at the end of Act 1, Scene 1, because it's really quite interesting. Um, so York, again, is opposed to Henry VI, and he's particularly opposed to the Duke of Gloucester, at this point in the play. The Duke of Gloucester is later brutally murdered by some other people who are opposed to him. Um, but one of the big bones of contention is that several provinces in France that were under English control have been ceded so that Henry could marry Margaret of Naples, who basically brings nothing but herself. And while it's not necessarily a bad thing to marry for love and all that, although he doesn't actually know her, um, medieval royal marriages were for political advantage. 
So that's the sort of background of the the discontent in the beginning. Um, and York had been protector of France. He, he had been um, sort of overlord of English territories in France. And so when specifically the provinces of Anjou and Maine are ceded to the king of Naples to get Henry's bride, York loses out. So he says here at the end of Act 1, Scene 1, Anjou and Maine are given to the French. Paris is lost. The state of Normandy stands on a tickle point. Now they are gone. Suffolk concluded on the articles. The peers agreed, and Henry was well pleased to change two dukedoms for a duke's fair daughter. I cannot blame them all. What is to them? Tis thine... Uh, Tis thine they give away, and not thine own, their own. Pirates may make cheap pennyworths of their pillage, and purchase friends, and give to courtesans, still revealing like lords, still reveling like lords, till all all be gone. While as the seely owner of the goods weeps over them, and wrings his hapless hands, and shakes his head, and trembles, stands aloof, while all is shared and all is borne away, ready to starve and dare not touch his own. So York must sit and fret and bite his tongue while his own lands are bargained for and sold. Methinks the realms of England, France, and Ireland bear that proportion of my flesh and blood, as did the fatal brand Althea burned in unto the prince's heart of Caledon. Anjou and Maine both given unto the French, cold news for me, for I had hope of France, even as I have of fertile England's soil. A day will come when York shall claim his own, a day, a day will come, uh, sorry, a day will come when York shall claim his own, and therefore I will take the Neville's parts, and make a show of love to proud Duke Humphrey, and when I spy advantage claim the crown, for that's the golden mark I seek to hit, nor shall proud Lancaster usurp my right, nor hold the scepter in his childish fish fist, nor wear the diadem upon his head whose church-like humors fits not for a crown. Then, York, be still a while till time do serve, watch thou and, and wake when others be asleep, to pry into the secrets of the state, till Henry surfeit in the joys of love with his new bride and England's dear-bought queen, and Humphrey with the peers be fallen at jars, then will I raise aloft the milk-white rose, with whose sweet smell the air shall be perfumed, and in my standard bear the arms of York to grapple with the house of Lancaster, and force perchance Perforce I'll make him yield the crown, whose bookish rule hath pulled fair England down. So what I find really striking about this speech from York is how much it prefigures Richard III. Shakespeare's Richard III, a play that comes several years after this. And this is Richard Plantagenet, Richard III's father. So Richard III is actually in this play. Um, he's called uh, Richard Crookback, or Crook, Crookback Richard. Um, he's very briefly in this play, uh, Henry VI, Part Two. But York, Richard Plantagenet, is a really central figure, and he runs a lot of schemes throughout the play. So he schemes against Gloucester, who's the Lord Protector, one of the, the strongest allies that Henry VI has. Um, York, along with a bunch of other lords and Queen Margaret, uh, Henry's wife, scheme against Gloucester to get him basically uh, arrested. And then he's murdered surreptitiously by uh, Somerset, I think. And the and the cardinal, the uh, cardinal of Winchester, bishop of Winchester. Sorry, um, the two. So Gloucester gets murdered later on. He's a good guy. He's not a traitor. He's he's done what he can to protect the king, but the king gets slightly convinced that Gloucester might be a traitor. And so he has him arrested with the intention of having a trial um, wherein Henry wants to find 
<clears throat> Gloucester innocent. But again, Gloucester gets murdered. So them's the breaks. Um, Henry is not pleased about that. But we also have here a scene that reveals Henry's weakness as a monarch. And again, this is one of the big issues. And we actually see this periodically throughout Shakespeare's history plays, especially the issue of weak kings is an incredible problem. Um, so this takes place in uh, Act 3, Scene 1. Um, they've just gotten the news that Gloucester is dead, that he's been murdered. They don't know for sure that he's been murdered yet, although interestingly enough, um, Or sorry, they haven't gotten the news yet. Um, uh, the king has just agreed to um, to arrest Gloucester, temporarily at least. Um, and H Henry basically, the, so they're having a sort of uh, um, a council meeting, which is sort of like a parliament meeting prior to the formation of contemporary parliament. And the king says, my lords, do what your wisdom seem, seemeth best do or un... Sorry. My lords, what to your wisdoms seemeth, seemeth best do or undo as if yourselves were here. As if ourselves were here. Sorry, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble reading this today. My lords, what to your wisdom seemeth best do or undo as if ourself were here. So basically, Henry says... Privy Council, you guys sort it out. I'm going to hit the brakes. Um, and Margaret says, what, will your highness leave the parliament? And Henry says, I am Margaret. My heart is drowned with grief, whose flood begins to flow within mine eyes, my body round and girt with misery. For what's more miserable than discontent? I, Uncle Humphrey, in thy face I see the map of honor, truth, and loyalty. Humphrey is Gloucester, by the way. Um, and yet, good Humphrey, is the hour to come that ere I proved thee false or feared thy faith, what lowering star now envies thy, thy estate, that these great lords and Margaret our queen do seek subversion of thy harmless life. Thou never didst them wrong, nor no man wrong. And as the butcher takes away the calf and binds the wretch and beats it with it when it strains, Bearing it to the bloody slaughterhouse, even so remorselessly, uh, even so remorseless have they borne him hence. And as the dam runs lowing up and down, looking at the way her harmless young one went, and can do not but wail her darling's loss, even so myself bewails good Gloucester's case with sad, help, unhelpful tears, and with dimmed eyes look after him and cannot do him good, so mighty are his vowed enemies. His fortunes I will weep and twixt each groan say, Who's a traitor? Gloucester he is not. This is the king of England. Basically saying, I believe Gloucester is innocent, but there isn't anything I can do about it. I'm too weak. I'm like a cow. I'm like a female cow watching after her innocent calf has been taken to the slaughterhouse. Um, so this is not a strong king. And again, that's a huge problem throughout Shakespeare's plays, because when you have a weak king that invites people to attempt to claim the crown for themselves, and this, of course, is what happens in Henry VI, Part Two. um, we get actually several people who attempt to claim the crown for themselves. Um... York being the main one. Um, but we actually have um, another guy who attempts to claim the crown. And I'll get to that in just a second, because he's a really interesting character. But um, Gloucester is murdered, and I want to talk about that for just a second. So Gloucester is um, strangled. Well, he, he's suffocated in his bed. Um, and what I one of the things that I find really interesting here is that we have 
a version of early forensic science. Because Warwick, um, Warwick claims that Gloucester has been murdered. And when Suffolk asks him to prove it, Warwick basically says, look at, look at his face, look at his complexion, like the way that his eyes are, are bulged out, the way his lips and nostrils are like surrounded by, by burst blood vessels and things like this. Like it's early forensic science. And Warwick basically says, I, I know that he died of suffocation rather than natural causes because these are the physical signs of it. These are, these, are, these are not the signs of a peaceful death. And so on the strength of that argument, Warwick convinces the king that Gloucester was murdered. So it's an interesting element. Um, the other component, the other element of the rebellion here, or of the, the challenging of Henry's throne, is by a guy named John Cade, who is from Kent. Um, and basically, Cade leads an uprising, a popular uprising of workers, peasants, artisans, etc., etc. Um, and they... Uh, Cade's position is kind of interesting here because he asserts that he is the son of nobles and therefore has a noble claim. And he, he, he claims that what he wants to do is to become the protector of Henry VI. But the rebels are also very anti-aristocratic. Uh, they want to kill all of the aristocrats they can get their hands on, um, and they do kill several of them. And and so, Cade's rebellion is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that it's set up by Richard, Duke of York, um, with the intention that because York gets sent to Ireland to put down a rebellion there, and so he's got a ton of soldiers. The intention is that. Cade's so York's intention is that Cade's rebellion will weaken the uh, the king's forces. And Richard can come back and take over, or he can join with Cade and they can overthrow the king and and place Richard on the throne. One of the things that's really striking to me about Cade is that he frequently talks about egalitarianism, freedom, liberation. So, for instance, in, in uh, Act 4, Scene 2, the very beginning of the rebellion, Cade says, Be brave, then, for your captain is brave and vows reformation. There shall be in England seven halfpenny loaves sold for a penny. The three-hooped pot shall have ten hoops, and I shall make it felony to drink small beer. All the realm shall be in common, and in Cheapside shall my palfrey go to grass. And when I am king, as king I will be. And all of his followers shout, God save your majesty. And Cade says, I thank you, good people. There shall be no money. All shall eat and drink on my score. And I will apparel them all in one livery that they may agree like brothers and worship me their lord. So Cade is very interesting here because not necessarily as much in the 1590s when this play was written, but later on, there becomes there there develops a strong thread of radical egalitarianism, and especially prominent by the 1630s and into the English Civil War in the 1640s. Um, at that stage, there were groups called uh, two of the two of these sort of radical egalitarian groups were the Levellers and the Diggers, also called the True Levellers. And basically, they believed in the abolition of property, in the abolition of social position, so that everything would be held in common. Um, and so we get that philosophy introduced here by Cade. So clearly, these ideas are already circling uh, in the 1590s, enough that people would recognize this character. But... 
What's striking to me is that while many of the people in Shakespeare's audience, the groundlings especially, the people who paid a penny and got to just sort of stand around the stage, while they would likely be quite sympathetic to Cade's position and this idea of egalitarianism and the destruction of class privilege, Cade very quickly becomes quite bloodthirsty and he he very brutally kills a number of innocent people um and so i don't think shakespeare is an is an egalitarian i do think shakespeare believes in social hierarchy and social privilege although there's disagreement about that i think shakespeare is very uh effectively invested in the class system of his era and I think the treatment of Cade is a good indication of that. The fact that this idea of equality and freedom and liberation is put into the mouth of someone who almost immediately becomes a bloodthirsty villain um, who is then killed in what is supposed to be quite a positive uh, death to that character I think it's very, very striking in terms of Shakespeare's attitudes toward social hierarchy and social class.